I suppose I was invited in particular on this topic because of um, extensive work over the years collaborating with various different, not only uh, disciplines, but geographic context. And so, you know, wanted to talk with you a little bit about how this is done. But uh, the nuances of doing collaborative research are, are um, several, but I think certainly worth discussing uh, for you moving forward. So can anyone tell me who this guy is? If anyone knows who the person is? Obviously, I'm an infectious disease faculty member, so you would imagine this person has some relationship to infectious diseases. Not Salk, but sort of similar time frame, pretty close. A little bit earlier. In many ways, this person would be considered the father of genetics. Um, and many of you might throw out a name like Watson and Crick, sadly, uh, that in fact, this is not Watson or Crick. This is Oswald Avery. Uh, for those of you who remember back to your days doing immunology and, and sort of bacterial pathogenesis, he was the guy that discovered these transposable elements that could move from strep pneumonia to, uh, from one species without a, a capsule to those, uh, or with a capsule to those without a capsule, and actually transferring the first evidence that, you know, sort of DNA existed, although he couldn't prove it at the time, and met with heavy resistance. But this is a kind of guy who actually did nothing uh, uh, but sort of research where he had heavy involvement in it, uh, unlike a lot of uh, current and even past investigators who would jump around and be in a lot of projects, and maybe they didn't get heavily involved. He refused to be on a paper unless he did almost all the heavy lifting itself. And I put him up here because he did most of the work uh, that he published by himself, um, although did have some collaborators. And this is just showing that sort of initial, probably one of the most important papers related to human genetics uh, coming from uh, bacterial uh, pathogenesis. Again, you see what includes really three authors. Again, he probably did 90% of the work, but um, you know, a paper of this magnitude today would have 15, 20, 30, even more authors uh, included in a group authorship. And uh, this is the VAX, the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, for which we remember myself. You can see uh, uh, Dave Rimland also in there uh, from the VA. Um, and this is a large uh, multi-center group, also includes other non-VAX partners, the Department of Defense, and so on and so forth. Again, doing cohort research, so you see sort of vaccine preventive research, clinical trials and cohort research, again, on large magnitude. So what is collaborative research? Well, obviously, it's got to involve more than one person. It typically represents more uh, than two different institutions, but can be within an institution, and involving typically people from different disciplines or fields, uh, or as some refer to even sectors of the economy. Um, and so why should we, we collaborate? Well, in part, uh, the funding sources can be coming from different streams, and you know, you're learning about things where you know, cardiovascular disease intersects with, with inflammation and immunology, and you see the same even with, with uh, neuro and, and endocrine relationships. So all of these different funding sources on the back end, if you're looking at NIH funding, may come from different institutes. You actually have collaborative relationships between the institutes, say, for example, NIMH and NIDDK would be kind of the mental health neuro group with this sort of endocrine diabetes uh, kidney group coming together to fund a particular project that's, say, looking at an endocrine uh, neurobehavioral research project, for example. Many, many other studies are currently being done with partnering uh, NIH funding sources and the like. There's also limited patient populations. This largely depends on the particular disease you're looking at. Again, cardiovascular disease, uh, you have a much wider patient population. If you look at a more focused population, you may have to partner with multiple institutions to get sufficient people. Uh, you know, complementary skills, certainly if you are living in a basic science world and you want to do translational research, you want to partner with someone who has the patients to, in order to do that, the individuals, the people. Similarly, if you're doing behavioral research, uh, you would need access to patient populations if you want to look at a clinical study, for example. Now, for those of us here in the room and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the other sites on this particular uh, meeting, this, this uh, uh, lecture series, you're all in some way 
clinicians and, and taking care of patients. You may not do that for the rest of your career, but that puts you in a very unique position when it comes to health research because you are at a very high valued position both for your access to patients but also for your understanding of the implications of the research being done. So that allows you, for, for individuals like myself and others, to be able to interact with multiple disciplines across both disease states as well as expertise. Uh, certainly, ease of communications ha has helped. We do a lot of these conferencing like this uh, online and, and can and interact with people from around the world. The new technology transfer uh, uh, relationships that exist in, in, in part through the, the Bayh-Dole Act that happened in the early 1980s that allows now government institutions to be able to uh, develop various uh, technologies and transfer those to industry to academia and so forth, where those, and Emory is a classic example of this, can benefit from the development of those various biologics, pharmaceuticals, and other types of technology. And certainly that, you know, we've seen these collaborations improve progress over time. They advance the field. They uh, lend to, to uh, additional insights into disease that weren't available before when people were very much more stove type. So just an example briefly for myself, um, one of the, what I would call transdisciplinary, we'll talk about what that means in a second, collaborations that I've been a part of for the last 13 years has been in South Africa. It began when I was a resident and fellow uh, in Boston, continued that through my time when I was in San Antonio in the military, and continues now uh, since I've been at Emory for the last seven years. And so despite my physical geographic movement, uh, this place is has maintained work over time. And that's because, again, we're dealing with diverse patient populations and cultural diversity. So we've brought in anthropologists to work with us. Uh, we work with all kinds of different topics. For example, we have uh, research that examines um, the social behavioral factors associated with treatment success in that setting. So we work with psychologists. We work with psychiatrists. Um, we're working with traditional healers. And then we as clinicians and our partner clinicians there are coming at it from different angles as well. And we have biostatisticians and epidemiologists that work with us in, in designing the studies and doing some of the analyses. And then we also have basic scientists that we work with too, doing the genetics, the virology, immunology, and uh, the pharmacology aspect. So it helps for us to be able to partner with these groups. We'll talk about this in a second, early on, um, and not kind of down the end of the road when we say, gee, it would have been great had we talked with this particular group or had we involved this other uh, type of expert earlier in the development. You really want to work with these folks uh, from the very beginning. And again, it allows us to get multiple different access to resources that suddenly a grant could come from a geneticist. Um, we're actually doing that just now. Our geneticist is writing two grants that's going to actually help in part fund our ongoing program there through the hiring and continuing of our existing clinical uh, uh, study staff members. So how do you do this? You know, again, easier said than done, certainly recognized. But there is a, there is a way to, to kind of schematize or, or strategize doing this kind of work. And I'm just going to go through these couple of key um, uh, aspects of how to do this, both the approach, how do you maintain collaborations over time, and some of the lessons I've learned. So uh, in general, the approach, for those of you familiar with the wildebeest migrations across various parts, uh, especially in, in East and, uh, and South Africa, you know that they cross these rivers. And uh, it's better to go with a larger group uh, in many of these circumstances because uh, it can confuse the crocs. Uh, they end up not knowing who to go after. They can be trampled in the mess. Uh, usually they get the, the weak or the old. Um, versus if you go by yourself, and certainly that can be uh, a greater challenge. So the first thing you want to do is decide if it's necessary. That's the first step. Do you need to collaborate? We'll talk about the risk benefits of that. Then you want to determine what's the best model you want to, do, you want to use in collaboration, and then understand the individual needs of the people in the relationship. You have to always be cognizant of their needs, because if those needs aren't at least being addressed or in some way met, that can cause the relationship to falter and then especially establish a leadership plan. And that's usually requested or required to be a part of most grants that you put together that focus on this. So what are the benefits? Well, higher impact 
more publications uh, come about, more funding and patents, some of the things we mentioned earlier, that's always going to be uh, one of the benefits uh, when collaborations are solid. Uh, there's more creativity, and the evidence has shown there's more enjoyment. It's really fantastic to hear from someone who's an engineer working from Georgia Tech. We have these great Georgia Research Alliance partnerships where Georgia Tech folks come over and talk from a very, very different perspective. And we hear from them, for example, that uh, from the clinical side, it, it helps reinvigorate, motivate them uh, when they go back to their labs. Uh, there is less work. Uh, certainly, when you divide up the tasks, writing becomes much, much easier. You give certain sections for people to do in your grants. It becomes less for you to physically write over time. The risk is, as the slide before showed with the, uh, the wildebeest, the, ri the risk is somewhat distributed. It uh, doesn't mean the risk itself necessarily goes down, except for the fact that these multiple disciplines can help identify areas where you may be at risk that you wouldn't have thought of before and can actually think of ways to mitigate that risk that, again, you would not have considered. Again, the diverse experience uh, and techniques helps to make your learning more efficient, improves that cycling process when you identify uh, findings and results, gives you insights in how to move forward. Uh, the follow-up work becomes more likely. It's certainly along the lines of the higher impact. But what the NIH looks for when you're actually putting applications together is does this team have a track record? Have they worked together before? Have these collaborations uh, uh, been brand new or they've been ongoing. And so the more you work with these groups, the more likely you're going to get funded in the future. Uh, allows you to be more agile, certainly. You work with different people and suddenly an, an opportunity opens up. You've got an established collaboration with someone who can allow you to jump on to RFAs or, or funding announcements uh, opportunities when they're out there. And also the kind of early critique process. So. Instead of putting together all your thoughts, you think it's perfect, it's beautiful, you put it out there as a grant or a publication, and suddenly someone from another field is reviewing that and tells, well, you never thought about it this way, or why didn't you consider this? Here you're getting those critiques before um, it's you know, too late or past the time of submission. And also in terms of adopting new guidelines, adopting new uh, methods of management or treatment or diagnosis, here you're getting more people involved and they can actually give you feedback earlier. What are the risks? Well, certainly you have to mitigate the risks of having people with coming from different disciplines, very, very different approaches. When you work, for example, as a clinical scientist, you work with behavioral folks, they often have a very different pace or understanding of uh, the urgency, for example, that you may be viewing uh, your work. And so that is a very anthropologist the same way. They may be at even further end of the, of the spectrum. And so being able to mitigate and, and work through that can be one of the challenges. Uh, there's certainly ethical considerations if you're working with individuals who may be, say, on the pharmaceutical side or they may be very much invested in the development of a particular diagnostic platform. You have to be aware that this can, can produce a conflict of interest. Certainly logistical issues. If you work with international partners, you're working with multiple institutions, you have to set up the relationships for funding. How does the funding go? It goes through a prime and then from the prime subcontracts go out. You may form different kinds of partnerships, uh, and all of those things, the, trans, the, the money exchange rates sometimes work very well in your favor. It's worked very well for us in the South African uh, setting for the last several years, um, but that can work against you at other times. So all of that stuff needs to be considered. We have an ongoing collaboration now in Shanghai, and the Chinese will not allow any specimens outside the country, and so you have to be aware that will change the way that you do the research, so you have to plan ahead for that and like I said, can, can actually be a, a risk. Uh, it definitely leads to longer review time. If you're used to working by yourself, it's nice to write your paper, write your grant, and not have any friction when you want to move that forward quickly. So you have to be aware there's going to be sometimes longer time than you would expect. And if you partner with groups like government-based organizations, whether that be the NIH, the CDC, uh, the Department of Defense, they often have to go through extra review processes that are not even involve, uh, involving the co-authors or, or the co-investigators, but involve other higher-up administrative folks. Uh, organizing meetings and schedules, you guys know well enough about that, so that certainly is a risk. And then when there's differences of opinion, you know, people come to the table and say, you know, at the end of the day, I hear you, I respect your opinion, but I really think this is the way we should go. You have to uh, you know, work that out if you want that collaboration to move forward. 
So just a bit about the models. Uh, what are the different models of, of uh, doing collaboration research? We're all familiar with the multidisciplinary model. This is now looked upon as the least favorable model, although it's not the non-ideal model. But be careful when you're using the language in your writing and your grants that you're actually reflecting really what you're doing. Multidisciplinary is sort of an additive process. It means you have multiple folks that are tangentially or more involved with the research coming from different disciplines, but they may not be directly interacting. You may ask them for feedback on a, on a proposal or on a paper. Hey, what do you think about this? Or what are your thoughts on this? Very late in the process. And that's fine. That's good. You get helpful feedback and sort of coordinating uh, for your overall goals but they're not interacting in the more sort of ground level. When you do interdisciplinary type of uh, a collaboration, this is more interactive. Here you're actually having individuals plan a bit more, coordinate a bit more what the research is gonna be. They come to the table earlier on in the process. Um, but the real ideal model is what's called transdisciplinary and how that differs from the others is this is an existing group from multiple disciplines who are already establishing a relationship together and they come up with the questions themselves as a group. Rather than you sit in your corner as a clinician and say, this guy's got high blood pressure, this is a particularly unique, interesting group, we think there's a genetic relationship, we want to go study this. And then you come and you write up a proposal, and then you, after the proposal's done, you bring in the social behavioral folks, you bring in the geneticists, and they look at it and go, I would not have designed it that way. You haven't taken into account the cultural or the dietary, the other factors that are in there. And then there's a push-pull, and well, we got to get the grant in, there's only a week left, and suddenly, you know, it kind of falls apart. Here, in a transdisciplinary reality, you have that group already set up. So you ask, as a group, well, what are the things that you want? What do you think are important? What do you want to study? What do you think is relevant? And as a group, you actually identify the question and develop it from the very ground point. So very important to have a leadership plan. Most NIH grants and other sort of foundational and institutional grants will ask you to put together a leadership plan, especially if there's multiple PIs involved. Uh, and this asks the question of who's going to lead this. At the end of the day, there still has to be one person, one uh, lady or man who is the contact person. So there always is going to be a singular person, but there could be multiple PIs who get together and say, well, this is the piece that I, I'm going to lead. If, if it's a behavioral piece, then any of the behavioral uh, uh, identification and, and work and, and studies, I'm going to take care of. If it's lab-based, I'm going to deal with anything on the lab side, and so on and so forth. Where, what is going to be the funding source? Again, if people coming from different disciplines, they want to identify what source they think is most relevant. Establish the roles up front, and that goes along with the authorship discussions, which are very prickly. No one wants to have those up front, but you really have to establish, okay, here's the paper that I would like to lead. I'm happy to have you serve as a senior, or I'll be the first author, and, and, and you can be the senior, and so on and so forth. But that has to be largely for the major aims established up front, if you can. There may be multiple other papers that come later on, and that may not be as important, but at least for the key, key uh, primary goals. Uh, data sharing and intellectual property, these are pieces depending on what you're expecting. Uh, in terms of, uh, of um, uh, in, uh, endpoints and outcomes and, and the like. What do you expect to produce from this? That should be discussed up front. And then your expectations. You know, we need to meet once a month or we're going to meet weekly and then we're going to have a, you know, an international meeting once a year or twice a year. Uh, what, what do we expect in terms of calls? What do I expect in terms of writing or, or in terms of physical work? If you're the clinician, I'm hoping for you to be able to enroll so many patients every month. I'm hoping for you to have this much follow-up. All of those things you want to spell out up front so there aren't uh, uh, mis-expectations down the road. So how do you maintain this? Well, during the project, you know, keep your meetings regular, short, and productive. Make sure you have an agenda, you have key goals that you want to, uh, to accomplish during the meeting, and keep the updates good and helpful. How many people have you enrolled? What's your retention look like? Do you have an interim analysis? Be sure to respect the boundaries and the needs of collaborators. There's sometimes I've been on where collaborators will ask to, to review every single iteration of the grant. You may not want to have them involved at that level, especially if you're a co-investigator. Maybe you want them to review a certain part of the grant or a certain part, part of the paper. Be sure that that's, uh, that that's respected up front. Again, adhere to those previous agreements, but be flexible as the new issues arise. Things may change. You may need to adapt or modify that and be ready to do so. 
Transparency and communication obviously are key. I won't go into that further. So after the project, make sure you update the collaborate, collaborators on follow-up findings, anything new that comes out, any publications, look for new ways to, to collaborate. A great way, I think, to keep people updated is any research that you read about, you find, send that out to your collaborators. Keep them on the hook. Oh, yeah, I remember working with that guy or that guy. I remember how, how uh, fun and enjoyable that was. Oh, that's a great idea. I happened to also have just come across something similar. That helps in terms of keeping things going or send funding announcements and so forth. And try to bring in new members into the group when their value can be uh, additive. So finally, lessons learned. I think the most important one uh, that I've learned over the years is research is challenging enough as it is. So really choose wisely the members of your research team. I can't emphasize this enough. You can get work accomplished one way or the other. You certainly can, but it becomes much more challenging if the people on your team are uh, their personality conflicts, there are challenges in terms of the way you view, view things philosophically. So you really want to choose people who you find to be positive, who seem to be very supportive of what, you, uh, what you're interested in, but still challenge you uh, intellectually and push you to, uh, to develop and, and perform better. Again, communication for a second and throughout. Manage accountability up front. Let people know what benchmarks and what expectations you have. And at the end of the day, consensus is not always required. Don't feel like you have to please everybody or you have to get a yes vote from the entire group. You will decide when things need a, an executive decision and when things have to be uh, you know, kind of meted out as a group. So in summary, collaborative research is becoming the standard, especially in the health sciences, as we mentioned. You need to assess your, your risk-benefit ratio up front. Careful planning makes a big difference down the road. Maintaining transparency, communication, and flexibility throughout, but make sure to communicate your, your goals, expectations, and, and the like up front. So there's a number of great resources. You'll find these in the, um, uh, in the slide set that's forwarded to you. And just uh, as Joe had asked me to remind you to check out uh, the website for Prime as the other conferences and lectures are recorded there that you can get uh, in case there are additional questions, additional questions, additional questions additional questions.